May I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So last week on Easter Day, we heard how the disciples had heard the news about Jesus not being there, not in the tomb from the women, and Peter had seen for himself the empty tomb. They were, it's fair to say, thrashing about in something of a muddle. And not much has changed by this week, as the disciples are still in a muddle, but now they're not even moving. They're standing still. They're staying behind locked doors. And it's not hard to understand why. Only two days earlier, Jesus has been executed. His body laid in a tomb. He was dead. Their movement was over with all its hopes and dreams. The disciples were numb. But then, the first Easter morning, the news began to spread. Astonishing news that Jesus was alive. And all this was a bit much for the disciples. And their minds and their emotions were stretched to the limit. It could be true or it could be a hallucination. Jesus has risen And yet these faithful disciples are locked in a room out of fear. Now we can understand their fear. The Romans had executed Jesus, had wanted him blotted out, and yet here he was again. To openly proclaim this return was to risk bringing unwanted and possibly violent attention to themselves. And yet these faithful Jews, for that is what these disciples were, were not prepared to give up their allegiance to Jesus and just, as it were, go back to being Jews. We're told that the great festival was going on, a key festival for the Jews, in which the disciples would have participated, but now they are torn. The Jews have conspired with the Romans to have Jesus killed. They do not believe he is the Son of God, but the disciples do but still they hide. So they're in a sort of limbo. They can't go back and they can't go forward. So they stay still behind a locked door. And the thing about a locked door is that, yes, it does keep people out, but it also keeps you in. Jerusalem was celebrating outside, but the disciples couldn't take part and they couldn't entrust themselves to this new reality that was emerging in Jesus. They were stuck and caught behind a locked door. And our gospel reading today, so often, is called Doubting Thomas. Poor Thomas, that's a label that's stuck for 2,000 years. But were the other disciples doing any better? You know, people are quick to make Thomas a sort of example of faithless doubt. As a matter of fact, the rest of the bunch didn't acquit themselves so well either. Jesus appears among them. They don't know how he got in, but there he was. Clearly, he must have been a bit different, but they were able to recognize him. He was smiling and talking and wishing them peace be with you. And then their objections melted. And they gave themselves to this new reality in Jesus. And their fear turns to joy in his presence, and one person was missing, Thomas. Why? What had taken him away that day? Why was he out of the room? Had they drawn lots for someone to venture out for food? Had they got into another quarrel about who was the greatest? Perhaps Thomas had gone off in a huff to compose himself. We'll never know. But we know that these first Christians were very, very human. So anything we might think could be the case could possibly be the case. You know, imagine if you'd missed one Sunday and coming in and everybody going, you'll never guess who turned up when you weren't here. (laughs) You know, the disciples tried to convince him, we have seen the Lord. You'd be going, (laughs) no. And Thomas didn't believe it either. He said, no, 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 no. I'm going to have to see the marks. I'm going to have to put my finger in. It's going to have to be very real for me to believe that. And he has to wait a week. That must have been a week, mustn't it? But he gets the proof he wants. 
And the thing I like about Thomas is that he waits that week. He sticks with it. He perseveres. He sticks around. Well, even with his doubts, he stays. Whatever had taken him away from the community, he came back. And one of Thomas's great virtues was that he absolutely refused to say he believed in something when he didn't necessarily, that he, he didn't, wasn't prepared to say that he understood something when he didn't understand. There's an uncompromising honesty about Thomas. He would never hide his doubts by pretending they didn't exist. And Jesus comes again, and Thomas is there. And he says, come on then, if that's what you need to do, come on, stick your fingers in. And I believe that Thomas doesn't. It's like he forgets his own ultimatum. Seeing Jesus is enough. Because even if he touches the wounds, he still has to make a response. Touching or not touching, it boils down to faith. And he exclaims, my Lord and my God, his profession of faith. And Jesus' response to Thomas is in the form of a beatitude, a blessing. He says, it's good that you believe because you've seen me, Thomas. Blessed are those who have not seen and believe. And like all the beatitudes, this one turns conventional wisdom on its head. We'd never say, we'd say, blessed are those who've seen and believed, but not Jesus. Because for Jesus, believing comes first. Believing leads to seeing. Believing leads to blessing. And it makes sense if you think about it. Some things in life you do get proof for, but not everything, and not the most important things. If you start a new marriage or a new career, you don't get to see into the future as to how it will work out. You have to believe that it will. And as you live in the new reality, over time, the proof begins to appear. The believing comes first. And Jesus says our life with God is like this. Belief comes first, and as we believe, the proof slowly begins to appear and bloom as our life is lived. At bottom, it's still a belief. But it's a reasonable belief. You don't have to take your brain out of your head to believe it. We don't get the same evidence that Thomas got. We get different evidence. But even Thomas could have still doubted with all that evidence in front of him. He could have doubted his own sanity. He chose to believe. We choose to believe. And Jesus says, in believing, we are blessed. So is it possible that the story in today's gospel is not so much about Thomas's doubts or disbelief, but about the failure of the disciples to act out theirs? Why should Thomas believe when all the rest of them were cowering behind closed doors, not acting as if they'd seen the risen Christ? They'd doubted too and not even voiced their doubts. So will those who come here seeking the risen Christ experience us as locked in here for fear? Or will they see us living out our faith despite possibly our own doubts? Do you believe that this church has a beautiful, flourishing, bright future? Or because you can't quite see it or picture it, you decide not to believe it? Now, I've not seen this church full every week. I've not seen it burst into the seams with families. I've not seen a church living out the gospel of love and forgiveness. Do I therefore doubt and not believe in you all? No. I believe that we can grow together 
heal the wounds of the past, build up our church life, welcome the families, the outcasts, the strangers. I don't want to be in a locked room with guys living in anxiety or fear, saying, oh no, will the Church of England survive? We have to have the faith that says, what we might not currently see, we have to believe in. There are undoubtedly challenges to face in the future. But if we're like Thomas, if we're honest about those doubts, voice them, seek reassurance from Jesus, he will offer it and will strengthen us on our journey. For the doubts are not about Jesus, the doubts are about ourselves. But we have a solid core of faith here. And if we put our trust in God, all will be well. Amen.